African-American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as aviation, sports, business, literature, politics, education, and history. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us on today's program is Professor Colin Palmer in the History Department at the Graduate School of the City University of New York, and I'm glad to have you with us today, Colin. Thank you very much. I know you are a specialist in diaspora studies, particularly the African diaspora, You've written a book, Passages, and you're working on another book, and you're doing a series for the Schomburg editing similar works on African-American history. Now, how do you define the African diaspora? Very briefly, I know you're very irritated. You've written <laughs> you know, hundreds of pages on this, but it's something that I, the audience, and you are always struggling with. How do you define it's, it? It's hard to define, in, mm. as you put it briefly, but let me set a little context before I define it. Um, as you know, the peoples of African descent are scattered all over the world. In fact, there may be as many as 600 million peoples of African mm -hmm. descent in our universe. The Americas, mm -hmm. if you restrict it to that, um, there are probably around 150 million people mm -hmm. who can trace their ancestry to Africa. Th that's in the Americas. In the Americas. That's the Caribbean. The Caribbean, South, South America, 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 North America. Mm -hmm. Brazil, Brazil, as you probably know, right. has about somewhere between 70 mm -hmm. and 80 million. Mm -hmm. The United States, probably around 36 mm -hmm. or 40 million. The rest of the hemisphere, the Caribbean basin, mm -hmm. about 35 million. So Africa has expanded in a mm -hmm. sense, not only geographically, but its genes have sort of uh, reconfigured the world. Now the question is, how do you come up with a definition that captures all of these diverse peoples? Do you simply say the diaspora is Africans abroad? That doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be um, intellectually precise enough. So what I am attempting to do in, in the works that I've written is to come up with a definition that captures the similarities of these peoples of African descent, the differences as well. So let's go beyond just Africans abroad. And Let's try this and see if it works. I think of the diaspora, the African diaspora, at, at its core as consisting of the millions of peoples of African descent who are united by a past based on racial oppression and resistance to it, mm -hmm. and who share an emotional bond with one another mm -hmm. and with their ancestral homeland and who, despite the differences among them, differences born of context and lifestyles and class and religious views and so on, despite all of these differences, they share, generally speaking, similar problems in constructing themselves and realizing their possibilities. So this, this um, definition captures the emotional connections between these people. It captures the fact that they've had a similar past, but it also emphasizes the fact that there are fundamental differences as well. Now, some of those fundamental differences, are they uh, are political? Are they the result of different levels of miscegenation? Are they a uh, result of colonialism? Or all of the above? All of the above, <laughs> because a Brazilian is, in many respects, quite different from a Jamaican. Mm -hmm. The Jamaican is quite different from a black American, mm -hmm. from an African American. Which the white community has used to divide us in yes, some ways. Yes, Well, it's a conflation, a homogeneity, a, 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 a image of a monolithic black world. Which and doesn't exist. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. not and at shouldn't all. exist, right. There is no monolithic African American society, well, for example. And there's no monolithic European society. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and it's the challenge is to not only determine these differences, but to determine points of connection mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. to me, those are the more enduring ones, and mm -hmm. those are the more interesting ones, because we share a common past, mm -hmm. a past based upon slavery and resistance mm -hmm. to that. And we share, wherever blacks are in the diaspora, we share a common struggle for self-determination, self-definition, and for social and political justice. Well, unlike other diasporas, the African diaspora is mainly as a result of we being taken from Africa 
rather than moving voluntarily through Europe and no, not, not quite. Let mm -hmm. me complicate it a little bit mm -hmm. more. I know uh, you feel that <laughs> way. Okay, let's hear it. Um, when most people think of the African diaspora, they think of the movement that's associated with slave mm -hmm. trade. Mm -hmm. But the slave trade was only one of many movements of African peoples. In fact, Africans have been in motion, in movement, mm -hmm. since about 100,000 years ago. And since the society began in yes, Africa, yes, they have yes, to be in yes, motion. Yes, right? the, uh, the great exodus mm -hmm. from Africa took place about 100,000 years ago. There was a second major exodus around. Now, by the, the way, where did that exodus go to? They went up all parts of the globe, mm -hmm. Europe, Asia, the mm -hmm. Middle East, and so on. Because at that time, yeah. it was easier to travel because there weren't as many waterways differentiating. Well, it was there. probably a very slow process, right. trial and error, mm -hmm. as people tried. And you're talking about hundreds of thousands of years, yes, realizing yes, that yes, it's only yes, 2,000 yes, years yes, uh, since yes, the birth yes, of Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. And after that, about 3,000 BC, you had the great Bantu migration mm -hmm. from West Africa to various parts of the continent to the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And starting around 5th century BC, BCE, you had the movement of Africans, traders, entrepreneurs, soldiers, a few slaves, and so on, up to the Middle East to Greece and Rome and to Asia. And then, uh, beginning around the mid-15th century, you had the movement of African peoples via the slave trade up to Europe, about mm -hmm. 200,000, and across the Atlantic, about 11 or 12 million, mm -hmm. maybe more. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, today, you have the continuous and continuing movement of African peoples from Haiti to Miami, from Jamaica to New York, from Brazil to Portugal, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the point is that African peoples have been characterized by movement, but these movements have been driven by a variety of circumstances. Some have been voluntary. Mm -hmm. The early ones that I address, mm -hmm. the, I would call the pre-modern diasporas, mm -hmm. those were essentially voluntary. Mm -hmm. The movement associated with the slave trade was involuntary. And that which we are to experiencing today is both voluntary and involuntary. Because of political oppression. Yes, of and course. And economic oppression. Of course. Right. One might argue that violence is not the determinant. Mm -hmm. The people are not being necessarily coerced into moving because of violence, although that might be, that's mm -hmm. present in some cases. But generally speaking, one might argue that economic deprivation is in fact mm -hmm. a coercive factor. Racial oppression is, in fact, a coercive um, uh, 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 factor here. Now, you talk <laughs> about these common threads, the emotional yeah. threads that carry through this. I was thinking, as you were talking about the yes. migrations 100,000 yes. years ago, yes. um, how are what elements of those migrations are still available for us to study and experience? Or has there been so much uh, assimilation that those vestiges of those experiences aren't around very much. I think some very creative scholars are examining linguistic connections, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are looking at archaeological remains. In fact, one of the most fascinating things going on right now is a study of the African presence in the Americas before Columbus. Mm -hmm. Now, that is still in its infancy, and there are a lot of silly claims that are being made. But put that aside, um, some very creative minds are looking at the art of the Americas to determine whether there were these early connections, to look at uh, a variety of artifacts, skeletal remains, and so on. The, the language systems that evolved in, in Central and South America. So there are a variety of things. It's hard work, it requires money, it requires determination, it requires patience, it requires some objectivity as well. So in as much as it's very hard to Re rediscover the past, to know the past, I think we can make some advances. <coughs> and what is necessary is originality and the will. Yeah, as a true <coughs> scholar, you certainly <coughs> are motivated by finding out these things. Yes, as a historian, yes. However, in the evolution of Africana or black yeah, studies, yeah. initially I think the uh, thrust for this, particularly when I was a professor at New yeah. York University, starting the African American Institute, it was a kind of a validation. Yes, we have a past. Yes, we have a history. Yes, we have a place. And yes, we are valued. Yes. Now, as you begin <coughs> to, and other diaspora students get yeah. into this, yeah. 
sometimes you find there are certain things that you're not necessarily particularly want to celebrate, yeah. but they are part of our history. Yes. yes. Uh, how do you see these diaspora studies, African, Africana mm -hmm. diaspora yeah. studies, differing from diaspora studies, let's say Jewish diaspora studies, or, uh, or uh, Arab diaspora studies? How do you see the, the differences? Are there common themes, or are there really differences? I think there are Let's look at the common themes first. There is certainly movement from a common mm -hmm. homeland mm -hmm. to a variety of places at the same time. That establishes the term diaspora. Yes, exactly. Which, by the way, one ought to make a distinction between a diaspora and a migration. Mm -hmm. A migration is the movement from one point to another, from Detroit to New York. Mm -hmm. But a, a migration, uh, a diaspora, diaspora, is the movement from one point to several points mm -hmm. simultaneously or over time. Um, the Igbo peoples of West Africa move into Jamaica, Brazil, North America, Cuba via the slave trade. That's a diaspora. Now, so <coughs> to get back to your question, there is a similarity of a, of a common homeland. There is a similarity of dispersal. And there is also the similarity of constructing new communities, mm -hmm. constructing new communities wherever these people um, found themselves. Is this a natural propensity of people to come together with similar interests? Yes. Or is it a <coughs> political uh, contingency that when you go somewhere else, you better get together to protect yourself? Well, well, well there's that, but it's also a very human thing mm -hmm. to, to create. The capacity to command your environment, mm -hmm. regardless of how you got there, to define yourself, to mark your own ground, so to speak. So that's common to all peoples. What distinguishes the African diaspora from many other diasporas is the fact of racial oppression. I think Africans, certainly since the Middle Ages, unlike most other peoples, have been the victim of sustained efforts to dehumanize them and to read them, so to speak, out of the human family. Well, and the also resistance to mm -hmm. that. But the Jewish diaspora has some of those elements. They, the Jews basically have uh, had to fight the religious oppression, discrimination. But it's uh, not based on color, per se, or race. Exactly. But it is. That's, that's very important. Okay. That's very important. So there are similarities, again, mm -hmm. there in, this, in the sense that there has been a coercive factor. But one of the other things that, that I think uh, one ought to highlight as we look at the African diaspora is the attempt to dehumanize, mm -hmm. to, de to make us, those of us of African descent, less than human, and to bolster this, to support this with a venomous body of literature, and to call upon science mm -hmm. to legitimize Pseudoscience. This. Well, pseudoscientific, pseudo yeah. you yeah. see? So I think in as much as we recognize similarities in these diasporas, let us also emphasize mm -hmm. that the sustained assault on the humanity of the peoples of African descent, in my opinion, has been unparalleled. It clearly, I think yeah. uh, the United Nations has an upcoming yeah. conference on the elimination of racial uh, discrimination and oppression in the world. Yeah. I was just at a meeting yeah. the other day yeah. Uh, where mm -hmm. they're planning that. They're going to bring yeah. people together yeah. from all over the world. And supposedly, yeah. Yeah. every nation is to talk about the racial problems that they have in their nation and ethnic problems yeah. and uh, what they're doing about it. Yeah. And yeah. the interesting thing is that the United States, which hasn't paid its dues to the United Nations, hasn't completed its report yet on the racism and its effect in this country, which then leads me to ask the yeah. question, uh, you talked about yeah. the oppression based on yeah. race and yeah. dehumanization. Is that a function out of European uh, tradition, or is that something that happened in India as well as it happened in Germany? I it think I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the origins appear to have been European. Mm -hmm. um, there are many scholars now who are tracing back the, this root, the, the roots of um, racial oppression to a variety of European societies. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have a student who has just published a very fine article that describes the ways in which Europeans had begun from the ninth century, so to speak, mm -hmm. to call into question the humanity of the peoples of African descent. So it's not an invention of the Americas. It was not invented on American soil. Mm 
but it took a particular route on American soil. It corrupted the institutions of this society in a way in which some other societies were not corrupted. South Africa, of course, is quite mm -hmm. similar to the United States in the sense that its mores, its values, its ethos were circumscribed and diminished mm -hmm. by this, what I've called a venomous ideology. That's really European colonialism. Yes, yes, yeah. of course, of course. The texture mm -hmm. has varied. The texture of racism has varied across the universe, but there have been some constants as well. Well, as you uh, explore this, as a historian, you don't try to solve problems, you try to reflect. But are there any generalizations that come from your work and that of other diaspora students that give us some cues as to where we might go in the future? Well, I think part of it is to recognize mm -hmm. that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Number one, that's what yes. the United Nations <laughs> Conference <laughs> that's, is about. That's right? number one, to, to recognize mm -hmm. the, 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 the pervasiveness of the issue. And secondly, this might sound rather simplistic, mm -hmm. for people of goodwill and strength mm -hmm. to assert a, a particular kind of leadership on unswerving leadership. Let's say the United States, for example, mm -hmm. is where we all live here, and where there have been attempts in recent times to revive a particular um, vitriolic form of racism. And this has been greeted by silence in some quarters. The times call for enlightened, pugnacious, and courageous leadership to call the nation back to its values, to its ideals. But one can't stop there. One has got to begin to introduce and embrace the kinds of policies that will result in structural change. It's not enough to say we all support equality. It's not enough to say we're anti-racist. It's not enough to say we condone prejudice of any sort. It's we easy to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, these things are not enough. What we need to do is to follow that through with the kinds of programs, the kinds of policies that will tend to improve the quality of life for all peoples to get rid of the barriers that circumscribe their human mm -hmm. possibilities. That's what we need. Well, the <coughs> mythologies that have developed by the African yes. people have made it difficult to cross those barriers across other yes. races and cultures. Yes. Yes. And it ends up to be a zero-sum game. Yes. That if you do something to help Africans and people of African descent, something's going to happen to uh, people of European descent. And as Jesse Jackson developed in his political yeah. campaigns yeah. in 84 and 88, there are many poor white people who suffer from the same kind of problem that African people suffer from. And the fact that the divide and conquer, as you had in the Old South, yeah, uh, yeah, led to yeah, yeah, uh, an institutionalization yeah, 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 of yeah, legal segregation, yeah, yeah. which now, fortunately, because of the civil rights movement, yeah. do doesn't exist. Yeah. But the internalization mm -hmm. exists. For example, we have the whole question of uh, black athletes. Mm -hmm. and they can play on the team, but they can't coach the team. They can't own the team. That is what some of us call institutional racism. Okay. Yet the white community sometimes says, well, look, if they were good enough, they'd be able to do it. Yes, and that's yes. one of the mythologies that's yes, been yes. developed. And that's one of the pernicious vestiges mm -hmm. of the past and, 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 and the present. Now, how do you move through that? Uh, you made, uh, you sounded like King for a moment, you made a moral <laughs> position. <laughs> I do have a moral but, uh, position. And I do too. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, the civil rights movement worked because of politics. Uh, the morality was the, the same thing in terms of uh, the Civil War. The morality was there, but the economics of the Civil you War see, caused the worked, union to, it to prevail. It when it appealed to conscience. It worked when it appealed to to the ideals of the nation. And it did mm -hmm. convince some people that what was then in progress True. was wrong. Mm -hmm. But you recall that when King moved beyond that, Poor he began to March. talk about ec um, economic change. Mm -hmm. Then he ran into a series mm -hmm. of problems mm -hmm. because that went to the heart of power relationships in the society. Mm -hmm. the, to bring people in to share in that pie, so mm -hmm. to speak to remove barriers to economic progress and to political power. That's where the issue 
became joined. And still remains joined. Yes. In fact, you probably know that the gap between the rich and the poor in the United mm -hmm. States is now the widest mm -hmm. in the Western democracies. Mm -hmm. And that is unacceptable because it's contrary to the ideals upon which the nation rested. And we want our politicians, we want our scholars to draw attention to this and to pay the price if there is a price to be paid. We've got but to the, the <coughs> price paid by the scholars or paid by the nation? Well, <laughs> sometimes scholars know what they ought mm -hmm. to do, but we oftentimes make an artificial distinction between what we find in the archives mm -hmm. and the present realities. I think we have an mm -hmm. obligation to, to disseminate what we have found and also, as best we can, to educate the public and to have this kind of a dialectical relationship going between ourselves who are more privileged really we have the time to study and reflect and folks mm -hmm. out there who need the information or who can um, use the inf whatever it is we, we, we provide and do something with it. Yeah. Do we not have an opportunity yeah. to attack racism better now because of the globalization of the economy? For example, in the emerging African yeah. nations, yeah. they can control, they can determine the extent of European in Asian, for that matter, introduction to their economy, they can exhort from them certain concessions, certain mm -hmm. things that would tend to diminish some of the economic effects. Then the question is, when you get past the economic effects, how do you deal with the emotional effects? How do you get people to say, look, I don't look at a person's color any more than I look at their height, yeah. and I judge on the basis of performance. That is the ideal. That is the, mm. the, the uh, democratic ideal. How do we move into that? I, I happen to think that sports helps to do it in some ways because the performance is performance on the field. In, the, in my case, as a Tuskegee Airman, yeah. the performance was our successful escorting of the bombers. So they couldn't say we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So but you how, have to, how do you move but into But you that? have to first remove the barriers mm -hmm. Right. to that particular mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. of performance. You have to create mm -hmm. access. Mm -hmm. And if again, if we can mm -hmm. take the story back to the United States, mm -hmm. so many of our young children, black and brown children, die an early death. And by that I mean they are they're killed off intellectually in those schools. Their possibilities are diminished by poverty. By killed off intellectually, you're talking about their intellectual skills or you're talking about their internalization both. of a sense of inferiority? Both, both, right. both, mm -hmm. both, both you see. So one can celebrate performance and that is important, but one, before one can get to that level, one has got to remove the barriers that, 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 that um, constrict people and prevent them from reaching their human possibilities. Mm -hmm. Part of this can be done through education to raise the right kinds of questions. You remember when the bell curve was published um, a couple of years ago, we went back to the old question of the inferiority of the peoples of African descent and so on. That creates a lot of burden for people to command your energies once again to fight old battles. Now that's the internalization part of it mm -hmm. you're talking about, mm -hmm. that here again people's humanity is being questioned. And we have to fight that. But we also have to do more, I think, and that is to organize to effect change. Not only the attitudinal change you're talking about, but the real structural change. That is the promise of the 21st century. Well, this, though, relates to the whole Black Studies, Africana Studies movement. As I yeah. said earlier, yeah. uh, I don't really like to use the word yeah. feel good, but yeah. it was a question of feeling that you have a past, yes, feeling that you have yes, a level yes, of importance. Yeah. The new generation of yeah. Africana and diaspora studies seems to be looking at the root causes mm -hmm. for the racism and the reaction to it and exploring, as you suggested, mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. for, uh, I happen to believe, in my area is urban education, that the public schools, the strength of the public schools is probably going to be the major breakthrough point and we are having great resistance yes. to some of the changes that yes. are necessary yes. Yes. in order to yeah. make it possible for yeah. every kid, yeah. whatever yeah. their race, but yeah. particularly African-American young people, to be able to gain yeah. 
those intellectual skills and that emotional strength Precisely. that allows them to say, I'm smart. And, and we've internalized this, you know, you're acting white if you study. I mean, I think we have pretty much, uh, hopefully, have passed that. But on the other hand, people who sing about this and make songs about it make money. Yes. Right? Which, yes. Are interesting yeah. enough, yeah. you find that 70% yeah. 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 of the hip-hop yeah. music is bought, uh, bought by white folks, yeah. which yeah. raises some yeah. interesting yeah. questions. Yeah. 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 Well, there's a, there's a very unhealthy racial zeitgeist mm -hmm. out there. Um, on the one hand, some peoples of African descent have bought into, have internalized some of these pernicious constructs we're, we're, we're talking about. Happily, the number is diminishing <laughs> um, as people become more aware, but that is still there. Mm -hmm. Some of the attitudes that inhibit um, people's progress and development of a healthy consciousness, mm -hmm. that is there. But on the other hand, we have to call attention to the efforts by some of the people in power to restrict access, the assaults that are being made on the schools, the, 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 the refusal to even provide the kinds of facilities in certain neighborhood, neighborhood schools that will help advance people who are mired in poverty. You, you, you know that um, uh, certain folks in Congress opposed um, the efforts to improve the schools. You know that in this state, uh, I read in the papers this morning, the attempt to um, assault um, early childhood education and so on. Now these are the kinds of things that will guarantee that certain people will remain trapped and mired mm -hmm. at the bottom. So in as much mm -hmm. as we contest the, the, the ideological stances that question the humanity and the capacity of peoples of African descent, we've got to combine that with the tangible efforts the tangible programs that will, will guarantee progress for all of the nation's peoples, black, brown, and white. That's a really beautiful summary of uh, our discussion of the African diaspora. We've been talking with Professor Colin Palmer of the History Department of the Graduate Center here at the City University of New York. Thanks for being with us, Colin. Thank you.